It's a real privilege to welcome you to this worship time here at Trinity in New Cumberland. Thank you for joining us. God knows the kind of week you've been through. For some of us, it was far too quick. For some of us, it was far too easy. For some of us, it was just far too difficult. But I want to remind you today, no matter what you've gone through, His grace is not far too far from you. Enjoy this time of worship. Celebrate the presence of God. Allow Him to reach you wherever you are by the power of His Spirit. We're focusing in this service on those words from the Lord's Prayer that teach us that worship is our responsibility. What are those words we're focusing on? The words are, Hallowed be your name. Welcome, my friend, and may God lead us through this time that we might truly experience His presence, His power, and His peace. A big thank you to everyone who participates in today's service to bring us one more step closer to an experience of worship. Worship is our responsibility. Let's worship Him in spirit and in truth. God bless you. Good morning. Please join us in our call to worship. Please join us by reading your parts. Lord, our Lord, 
How majestic is your name in all the earth. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. together. Holy, holy, holy are you, our Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory be to you, O God Most High. We come to praise your holy name, and we come to bow before you in adoration. We pause to confess that we have not always revered your name. Forgive those among us who have taken your name in vain, either in frustration or in anger. Remind us that in doing so, we disregard you as our great creator and make ourselves liable to judgment. Remind us that to take your name in vain is to disregard your holiness. Remind us that to make promises in your name and not keep them is to dishonor your glory. We repent. We are sorry. Please forgive us and cleanse us and give us strength to gain new patterns of reverent speech. Grant us a fresh view of who you really are. May we never take your grace for granted, nor treat your fatherly love with disdain. Grant us the faith to call upon your holy name in love and devotion, so that we are kept safe and shaped to become better disciples and worshipers. In Jesus' holy name, amen.
First scripture for this service is taken from Psalms 95 verses 1 through 7. I invite you to follow with me in your Bibles. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountain are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And the dry land which his hands have formed. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Good morning, everybody. Hope everyone is having a great start to your summer. This morning, I want to talk to you about something that happens to me, sometimes a lot. I don't know about you, but when I talk to somebody on the telephone, I have a hard time thinking of what I want to say. I call them up, press their number in, they answer, hello. I say, hi, how are you? They're like, I'm good, how are you? I'm like, I'm fine. And then silence happens. I simply can't think of what to say. Has that ever happened to you? You know, prayer's a little bit like calling God on the telephone. I realize I don't use this phone. I don't have a phone number for God. But we can talk to God any time of the day or night. But sometimes I don't always know what to say when I'm praying to God. I can't think of what to say next. When I eat, it's a little bit easier. I'm saying, thank you, God, for this food. Or if I'm praying before I go to sleep, I might say what many of you have learned now I lay me down to sleep or I ask God to keep people in my life in prayer people that I'm worried about but you know Jesus knows that we sometimes struggle in knowing what to say and how to pray that's why he gave us an example of how to pray and it's what we usually call the Lord's Prayer 
Do you know how it goes? I know some of you have learned it in Sunday school. And some of you may not know it yet, but you will learn it. And it's something that you hear every Sunday in church. And if you know it, I'd like you to say it with me now because we're going to recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful prayer? Jesus gave it to us as an example so we would know what to say when we talk to our Heavenly Father. And it's okay if you sometimes don't know what to say. It can just be, hi, God. It's Cheryl, you know looking for some help today, or I'm having a wonderful day. Thank you for the sunshine. It's okay. It can be something very short or it can be something very long. I just want you to know that God is always listening to our prayers. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the example that Jesus gave us so we would know how to pray. Help us understand that prayer is talking to you, thanking you for all you do, asking you to lead us in our daily life and telling you what is on our mind each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Once again, it's so good to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. I just want to say it's been a great time last night having all of you who came and joined us at the Borough Park. I look forward to hearing feedback from you and of how we might proceed in our steps in the future. Also looking forward to another Zoom call with the congregation. If you have friends in the congregation who don't use computers, please tell them that they can dial in to the Zoom call with their telephones and they can join us as well. We're looking forward to Vacation Bible School and there's so much we have to do in terms of our regathering process, all the limitations and restrictions and care. So please continue to follow the guidelines we presented to you in our letter. Access to the church building is presently restricted and goes by appointments and only certain spaces within it. We're trying to be as careful as we can. It's been a time and a week in which the numbers have not been good We've had an increase of cases globally and even in the U.S., so we continue to pray for God's healing mercy. We're also praying for our country as we face racial tension and pain. We pray that every life be valued. We pray for those who have really been hurt and offended and mistreated, that God's grace and mercy and justice would come to them, and we would be a people who stand in solidarity with the broken want to thank you for being with us today. God bless all of you as we continue to worship Him in spirit and in truth.
traveling around, you discover that people in different cultures give different types of names to their children. In one of my travels in a part of my country, India, that I shall leave unnamed for you, I came across some fascinating names that I could recommend to you. I came out of a church building, met a young man and said, Hello, my name is Arun. What's yours? He looked at me and said, Thank you. I said, I didn't ask you for that. Tell me what your name is. And the young man said, Well, my name is Thank You. I came out of another meeting, met a young man and said, Hello, my name is Arun. What's yours? He said, I'm teaching well. I said, I didn't ask you for what you're doing, friend. Tell me what your name is. He said, Well, my name is Teaching Well, and incidentally, I'm a teacher in a local government high school. I came across two sisters. One's name was Brooklet, the other's name was Rivulet. Two brothers. One's name was Hammer, the other's name was Ladder. But these three brothers, they really take the cake. I didn't meet them, but I heard about their names. Their names apparently were first gear, second gear, third gear. I thought their father must have been one passionate Formula Racing fan, and if they ever had a sister, they might have been tempted to call her reverse gear. Names. As God looks at the millions and billions of us across the continents, He is the only one who can look at us and say, I know you by name. Welcome back to our series on the Lord's Prayer. We're looking at this prayer in a series titled, A Prayer for All Seasons. In our previous messages, we had message number one, in which we focused on our Father, and those words told us God is our security. In the second message, we focused on the words which art in heaven, which told us about God and His authority. Today we're considering, hallowed be thy name, worship is our responsibility. There's a question from the Westminster Catechism, which has often been quoted. What is that quote? It comes with a question and an answer. The question is, what is the chief end of man or human humanity? The answer is, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. The Apostle Paul, writing in 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, So whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. At the heart of worship is worship from the heart, my friend. Please listen to these words from Abraham Heschel. Faith is not the clinging to a shrine, but an endless pilgrimage of the heart, audacious longing, burning songs, daring thoughts, an impulse overwhelming the heart, usurping the mind. These are all a drive toward loving the one who rings our heart like a bell. Friend, let me ask you some questions. What is worship? Is worship centered in the fear of consequences or in the liberty of grace? Is worship offered as one looks away from the gaze of an angry God or as one looks eagerly into the face of a loving Father? Is worship the reluctant offering of a burdened life or the delightful expression of a blessed life? Is worship the expression of a moment or the experience of a lifetime? After attending church one Sunday morning, a little boy knelt at his bedside and prayed, Dear God, we had such a good time at church today, but I wish you had been there. My friend, Christian activity or traditions that are not singularly centered on God and His glory are not worship. Oh, that we would long for the presence of God. Oh, that we would yearn for the intimacy of God. Oh, that we would seek for the glory of God. One of the most beautifully quoted definitions of worship is that from Archbishop William Temple. Listen to this. Worship is the submission of all our nature to God. It is the quickening of conscience by His holiness, nourishment of mind by His truth, purifying of the imagination by His beauty, opening of the heart to His love, submission of will to His purpose, and all this gathered in adoration is the greatest of human expressions of which we are capable. End of quote. How can we, as God's people, live to honor the words our Lord gave us in this prayer for all seasons? Matthew 6, 9, Hallowed be thy name. 
Have you deeply thought about those words? What do they mean? Have you meaningfully and truthfully uttered them? Let me quote for you from William Barclay. The word which is translated hallowed is a part of the Greek verb hagia zestai. The Greek verb is connected with the adjective hagios. Hagios is the word which usually translates holy. But the basic meaning of hagios is different or separate. A thing which is hagios is separate from other things. A person who is hagios is separate from other people. So a temple is hagios because it is different from other buildings. An altar is hagios because it exists for a different purpose from the purpose of ordinary things. God's day is hagios because it is different from other days. A priest is hagios because he is separate from other men. So then this petition means let God's name be treated differently from all other names. Let God's name be given a position which is absolutely unique. Hallowed be your name. How can we live in honor of that invitation? I think we can live in honor of that invitation when we practice some life-altering principles. Principle number one, when my words become worship. The year was 1984 or 85. I was well into my program as a student pursuing a degree in economics at the Madras Christian College in what is now known as the city of Chennai, India. My classmates and friends knew that I was a disciple of the Lord Jesus as I had testified to many of them about how Jesus had changed my life and given me meaning. I was so passionate about telling the story of Jesus that in my first semester I shared the gospel personally and individually with as many as 60 people. Then one afternoon my classmates and I were walking from campus to the local railway station on our way home. As we were walking I was describing something to my group of friends when in my narration I used the word bloody in an unbecoming manner. My friends who had never heard me use a curse word or a bad word until then were absolutely shocked. They all stopped dead in their tracks. They turned at me with utter disbelief and said, You? You said that? I cannot tell you, my friend, how shamed I was for letting the Lord down that day. I came home and cried bitterly for failing Him. My friend, our words matter. How we speak matters. Our tone matters. The first way in which we can honor the words, Hallowed be your name, is by guarding our tongues. Let me quote for you from the words of James, chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Close quote. My friend, haven't you heard people? Heard of them who've lost jobs, lost face, lost reputation, lost liberty because of the words they used? Words that burned like the fires of hell? Words that left nauseating impacts much after they were uttered? Words that hurt? Words that horrified? Words that demoralized? Words that did not build but broke? Are you guilty of speaking such words? Are you guilty of using the name of Jesus lightly? Do you use the name of God to curse His name that we should not take in vain? It seems the preacher was making his rounds to his parishioners on a bicycle when he came across a little fellow who was trying to sell a lawnmower. How much do you want for that boy? The boy said, I just need enough money to go out and buy a bicycle. The compassionate preacher said, well, would you like to trade in this bike so that I can take the mower? The boy said, well, let me try your cycle out first. And he tried it out and said, mister, you've got a deal. The preacher took the mower and began to crank it. He pulled on the rope a few times with no response from the mower. The preacher called the little boy over and said, hey, fellow, I can't get this mower to start. The little boy said, well, sir, that's because you have to cuss as you wanted to start. The preacher said, I'm a minister and I can't cuss. It's been a long time since I've been saved and I don't even remember how to cuss. 
The little boy looked at him happily and said, You just keep pulling on that rope, sir. It'll all come back to you. By contrast to that joke, I think some people have to work extra hard to keep some words away from their lips. Please listen to James again in chapter 3, verses 9 to 10. With the tongue we praise our Father and Lord, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praising and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Four little words say it powerfully. This should not be. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6 says, Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Psalm 19 and verse 14, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. There was a time in my ministry years ago when I used to receive phone calls from a foul-mouthed man. He was a member of my church and tested my patience very much. In honor of him, I had printed and placed these words beside my office telephone. Proverbs 15.1 A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And oh, how I thank God for those words. My friend... Do you have to repent of hasty words, harsh words, hurtful words? Turn to the Lord now. This is your moment of grace. Ask Him for forgiveness and strength to speak words of grace, love, and mercy. The question we've been asking is this one. How can I honor the prayer, hallowed be your name? Principle number one, I can honor it when my words become worship. Principle number two, I can honor it when my work becomes worship. I believe many of you might have heard the words, work is worship. These words are especially common in the East. They're painted on buses, on office walls, and on wall plaques. They are oft quoted words. Let's go back to the words from the Bible, from 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. These words have far-reaching implications, my friend. Whether you're working towards an academic accomplishment, working for a salary or a wage, working to beautify a garden, working as a volunteer, working on a picture you're painting, working on a sports or fitness goal, the list can go on. The Bible is telling us that as disciples of the Lord Jesus and children of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, we can turn all our work into worship. In fact, when we really learn the secret, we begin to enjoy life in a different way. God's help will ultimately end up not just allowing us doing what we enjoy, but really enjoying what we do. Please listen to that again. By God's help, we will ultimately end up not just doing what we enjoy, but enjoying what we do. In the classic movie, Chariots of Fire, which is based on the 1924 Olympics and two prominent runners, Eric Little and Harold Abrams, both being gifted and successful athletes who carried the hopes of their respective nations on their backs when they raced, Eric Little, being a devout Christian who represented Scotland, he was a missionary and some believed he should give up the sport to preach. But little believed that God had called him to race and to race for the glory of God. Harold Abrahams ran for Great Britain. He loved his country as well as the sport and was obsessed with winning. He studied the sport, threw himself completely into it and made running his one and all passion. In the movie, you see a clear contrast between Little and Abrams. They both run, but they run for very different reasons. In one scene, Abrams says, And now, in one hour's time, I will be out there again. I will raise my eyes and look down that corridor, four feet wide, with ten lonely seconds to justify my whole existence. But will I? But will I? In a different scene, Little says, 
I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Pastor and author Tim Keller, in comparing the two runners as depicted in the movie, states, Harold Abrams was weary even when he rested, and Eric Little was rested even when he was exerting himself. Why? Because there's a work underneath our work that we really need rest from. It's the work of self-justification. Abrams seeks satisfaction and joy in the race, and it always eludes him. Little finds satisfaction in Christ and experiences joy as he runs. The parable of the three stonecutters is popularized by Peter Drucker. A man came across three stonecutters and asked them what they were doing. The first replied, I'm making a living. The second kept on hammering while he said, I'm doing the best job of stone cutting in the entire county. The third looked up with a visionary gleam in his eyes and said, I am building a cathedral. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, the Lord Jesus said, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I remember when I was in high school how I developed the discipline of pausing after I studied or revised two pages in my book. I would pause and say, Lord, I did my part. Please help me to remember. And at the right-hand top of the page, I would write three letters in there, I-J-N, in Jesus' name. With that simple discipline, studying became an interactive experience of worship for me. It was a time in which the common things of life became hagios. 1 Corinthians 10.31 So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Yes, the words, hallowed be your name, reminds me that worship is my responsibility. How can I honor that prayer? I can honor it, number one, when my words become worship. Number two, when my work becomes worship. And finally, when my witness becomes worship. There's so much to say about this, but with the brevity of time on my hand, let me turn to the book of Job. The book starts by telling us in Job 1.1, In the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. At that moment, my friend, Job appeared to be at the pinnacle of success. His finances were flourishing. His business was thriving. His team was growing. And then the Bible says he had a day in which he was hit by tragedy upon tragedy. He lost all his cattle and his wealth and his team. And when the news of the devastation came one after the other, Job remained silent. But when the news arrived that his children had died, not one, not two, not three, but ten of them on a single day, the Bible says in Job 1.20, At this Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. At this point the record could have read, And he screamed and cursed and questioned God. Is this how you treat the faithful? Is this the extent of your mercy? Is this how your universe functions? Instead the Bible says, At this Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord is taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. At the heart of his brokenness, my friend, Job discovered the key to his healing, and that key was worship. Yes, the words, hallowed be your name, reminds me that worship is my responsibility. How can I honor that prayer? I can honor it, number one, when my words become worship. Number two, when my work becomes worship. And number three, no matter what I go through, when my witness for God becomes worship. 
The story is told of a young soldier who was badly injured in battle. He survived having lost the ability to use his legs and also lost vision in both of his eyes. During his time at hospital, a very kind nurse befriended him and found out that he loved to play the piano. As she saw him recover, the nurse told him that there was a piano in the lobby of the hospital that he could play. One day the soldier mustered courage to go to the piano and began to play. And when he finished his first song, there was loud applause and cheering. Day after day he came to that piano and played, and steadily the applause became lesser and fewer and finally stopped. His playing had now become commonplace. One day the discouraged soldier told himself, No one appreciates what I do, so I will play for the last time today and not play anymore. When he took his fingers off the keyboard after the final piece that day, he heard an applause from a single individual. He heard the hand clap and hearing it turned in the direction of the applause. Not being able to see, he said, Thank you so much. And then he heard these words, Well done, soldier. This is your king here. I'm here to visit my soldiers in hospital today. Play on, good soldier, your king is listening. Play on, good soldier, your king is listening. My friend, as a disciple of the Lord Jesus, no matter where you are, no matter what you do, when your heart is a heart of worship, it doesn't matter if people appreciated you or not. It doesn't matter if you got the headlines or the limelight or not, but it just matters that you hear the king whispering to you, play on, good child of mine. I'm listening to you. Let's bow in a moment of prayer. Father, we look to you this moment and we speak those words. Hallowed be your name. Lord, we've spoken those words so many times, but today we ask that you will help us, that our words become worship to you, Lord. Forgive us for every hasty word. Forgive us for every wrongful, offending word. Lord, cleanse, Lord, the words that we speak, that they may be coming to people with encouragement and blessing. And Father, we pray that our work, whatever we do, will be worship to you. Lord, that we will not only do the things we enjoy, but we'll enjoy the things we do. And Father, we pray, no matter what life brings us, that we will be witnesses, witnesses in worship to you. Thank you for hearing us. The next time we utter those words, hallowed be your name. May we be disciples of greater consecration and love and dedication to you. Thank you for hearing us, Lord. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
now may the God whose name we rever, the holy, holy, holy God, the one who is always faithful to us, may he bless, preserve, and keep you. The Lord mercifully look upon you with his favor and grant you his everlasting peace this moment and forevermore, beloved. Amen. Thank you.